found my missing cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing swimming in it. Not bad. This is a shameless plug. <laughs> You could call it an introduction to uh, principles of life. What we want to do is, I keep getting this statement made by Christians to me all the time and by other people, and you know, sometimes it's expressed in a variety of ways. Sometimes it's said that, you know, if they only knew what to do, you know, if they only had a a blueprint, you know, it's like my wife says it many times, and I always. <laughs> react to it <laughs> and I say something about it. She says, well, if only there was, you know, like an instruction book. I say, there is the Bible. You know, that bluntly, there always was instructions. That's partially why we had Levitical laws and things like that in the Old Testament because it was instructing the Levites what to do. <laughs> it's called the instructions. And that's kind of what Torah means, really. But the point being is this, is that we all have supposedly, you know, this wrong idea that there isn't a manual or there isn't some prescribed way of doing things. Somehow, there's this idea that we just imitate our parents or we imitate society or we do things a certain way based upon what we now, in our modern technology, see on TV. And the truth is, I have watched this change over the years. I mean. I am amazed to watch something like when I was growing up, either MASH or or Archie Bunker, you know, and see how it was really very carefully contrived in order to not offend people, you know, in some way. And now it wouldn't even be considered offensive, you know, and to watch society change that much and then to not have some kind of standard. It's like I recall just reading on the internet recently that there was a, a posting by a Southern Baptist or something and he said, we're now considered legalists because we hold a standard of ethics and morality that others don't because they tell women to do certain things or they tell men to act certain ways and they say, no, we're not going to go with society standards. If you want to be with us, you go by our standards. And so there's certain things that when you talk about ethics and you talk about morality and you talk about society, we're talking about principles of conduct. It's kind of like right now, there's this huge, unbelievable hyper-patriotism going on. That terrifies me. I mean, I don't understand how Christians don't know what hyper or uber-patriotism is. You see. The whole concept in Germany behind a fatherland was that it was able to personify the people as supportive of the state, that they were supportive of the militaristic idea that the German people were military. They were very militaristic oriented, that they were the superior race of military type people. And I'm sure you've seen in some Star Trek or some other thing where people get kind of gung-ho and they want to be the A-team or the Marines or, you know, the best of the best, you know, army, go army so that you could be all that you can be. I mean, those are uber patriotism. It means that you've taken this principle of patriotism, but you've gone to the uber or the utmost or the extreme version of it that you've blown it out of proportion. Military service was never meant to be something to be exal exalted to the heavens and said, oh, our warriors are so great. No. War is a tragedy. It's a devastation. It's something we should not learn because we're going to unlearn that because nation shall beat their swords into plowshares. They shall turn their spears into pruning hooks, and nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. War is an acquired learning. You don't just start off learning how to fight. You acquire it through the 
declination of your morality to find yourself in a position where you can no longer solve things the way Jesus intended us to solve them, which was by love we would be known as his disciples, as opposed to by war we would be known as what mankind has done all along. And that is, ever since Cain slew Abel, we have been at violent people. And we are not meant for violence. We are meant for peace. The Prince of Peace will not come with violence. He will come and he can say one word at the Valley of Megiddo. Peace, be still, and everything goes obliterated. That's the way it works. God can do with one word what we can't do with millions of arms and weapons and schemes and programs. So, because of these outward exaggerations, because man no longer is using any type of instruction book, because people are complaining that there is no standard, that we have a society that says that you can have a man cave because you're supposed to act like a caveman, and that we somehow have on television cavemen selling things as though that were a wonderful idea. I see Jesus as my ideal man. I see the Son of God as what humanity is meant to be. I see the Bible as the book that God intended for us to understand and to use as a standard of living for our life. A lot of other people agree with me. One of the things that we're going to look at in Principles of Life is the Institute of Basic Youth Complex is that a long time ago, in its heyday, I don't even, just so people know, I have no idea what they're doing today. I have no idea what they've done in the last 10 years. So if you're going to you know, have a problem with it, <laughs> go somewhere else. <laughs> you're going to get the revised version according to me and the Holy Spirit. Okay, maybe not me at all, but only the Holy Spirit. And I'm using this book. It's called the Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts. It's from uh, Bill Gothard Ministries from way back when. Research and Principles of Life. And these are given out when you go to, I think it's, I forget how many hours seminar, but it's like, you go to, let's see, you join it at some point in time and you go through 32 hours of lectures, diagrams, and charts to make up the basic seminar. And then they go back and they go every year, you can go back and get you know updates and stuff. But it was called the Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts because it helped for communication and development of a relation type basis where you have communication and you go back and forth and you're able to learn what conflicts are, how to resolve conflicts, how to deal with conscience, how to deal with morality, how to deal with responsibility, how to deal with success. And those are principles that I see lacking in our examination of ourselves because we haven't taught our children anything if anything, we claim that somehow they're a good mother because they are there. Well, a mother has a responsibility to set up a home, to, to ensure the environment of the home, to maintain the emotional balance of the home. She has all kinds of skills and abilities that she probably doesn't realize she has because we no longer have schools of etiquette. We no longer have these schools where Women are taught how to develop certain graces and certain capabilities that were they used today, men would say, wow, I want that woman. <laughs> She's wonderful. And you see, at one point in time, that's the way that the world felt about the children of Israel's wives. They all wanted the Jewish women because they were different. God had blessed them. So in Principles of Life, I'm making a shameless plug because... I'm not supposed to say dates because, you know, these will be recorded and I put numbers on them so you can find them rather than look for a date, but every Tuesday. <laughs> I blew that one, didn't I? But anyways, later on, who knows, may record them other times, so I'm not going to say Tuesdays, but for the most part, on Facebook right now, you know, we're posting these on Tuesdays. We call it Teaching Tuesday. But it's going to be Principles of Life with me. No, actually with, with God. But... We're going to read them. We're going to explain them. 
we're going to talk about just the textbook. Well, there's no notes in here, so in case you're wondering, no notes. There's just the, you know, notes that are already pre-printed. So if somebody, you know, some scholar from the Institute, you know, gets a hold of these videos and says, ah, he's not doing it the way we did it. You know, I'll say, you're right. <laughs> Guess what? I didn't go. But I knew the text because my roommate met, you know, and we used to discuss it and we used to talk and we used to share things. And we had a wonderful time of developing, you know, what we felt like was God inspiring us by way of the teaching that he'd received in the schematics and notes and everything else that he had when I was living with Christian roommates. So, in this Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts, using this as our foundation, not as our box, we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to begin to teach you, man, woman, teenager, child, adult, or youth, how to deal with basic principles of life. And those principles of life will apply very quickly and dramatically to your way of examining scripture and your personal relationship with God as well as every other relationship in life that you have. This isn't a success manual. This actually is, <laughs> it's going to sound pretty sad because when you get into it you're going to think, wow man, those, that's, that's profound. In reality this is really like basics. I mean. I've read books and I still have them in my library of like real meaty stuff, you know, that unfortunately in our generation now with the way that people have grown up with the idea of man caves and personal rights and they have the right to bear arms, you know, and the right to do this and the right to do that and they are violent and they go out and do violence and they think that this is this and that is that, they can't even teach those things because people aren't ready for them. They don't even begin to go towards such topics as, you know, dealing with world subjects that possibly they don't realize they're pretty fortunate in being spoiled in America because if they were in any other country, eh, they wouldn't be thinking the way they think. And enough left said because except that you're a spoiled brat, you wouldn't have a man cave. That's the bottom line. Because how could you have a man cave when there's billions of starving people in the world. I mean, can you tell me that? Honestly? Do you have a world vision? Do you have a world principle? Do you have principles of life that you're willing to live by? That you could communicate through three generations and they would be raised up godly men and women of God? Because I can tell you this, I doubt, seriously, most of you that are watching this video have godly children or are godly yourself. But you can, at any point in time, turn that around. First of all, you know, you have to be born again, so frankly, you know, you could turn it around mentally, but guess what? <laughs> it won't last. <laughs> but if you get born again of the Spirit, you know, and God is working on you, and working in you, and working with you, and working for you, and He decides to do it to you, then guess what? He's going to take you through you to exemplify godliness in your life so that you could affect everyone around you. So we're going to take these principles of life, thick book, and we're going to teach. I keep saying, I'm not a teacher. I'm not. I keep telling people that I am not a teacher. But we're going to read it, explain it, you know, and get through it. And this is a, like I said, a shameless plug. So what will be fun is that it starts off really interesting is that it goes into six areas of conflict and then principles in applying scripture. Uh, boy, let's see. Tracing problems to root causes. I mean, right off the bat, I think if you'll join with me, we're only taking one page at a time, you'll get some powerful stuff out of it. And maybe you won't. Maybe you already know it all. But we're going to examine, for instance, this might even be six tapes. Who knows? <laughs> but just to give you a taste. Tastes like a finger. <laughs> First page, six areas of conflict. One, assurance of salvation. Scripture assures us that it is possible to know beyond all doubt that we do possess eternal life. 1 John 5.13 However, 
in the minds of many, there are distracting doubts about whether or not they really are Christians. They have gone forward or raised their hand in meetings to receive Jesus. They have also prayed and asked him to come into their lives, but doubts still persist. That's a biggie, isn't it? Do you have doubts of your assurance? In one of the other teachings that I'm doing on Tuesdays, which is uh, from Bible studies, we are going through the five assurances. Assurance of salvation, assurance of forgiveness, assurance of guidance, assurance of answered prayer, and assurance of wisdom. The five assurances. That's from navigators. They give you a very precise and concise way to take five scriptures, apply them to your life, and to take them as a home Bible study to everywhere and anyone so that you would fulfill the great commission that was to go out and teach all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, you know, not be a Catholic about it, do this, but to teach them the things that Jesus said, to teach them five things that would take them all the way through the rest of their life. So they would have that basic foundation that no matter what is unshakable, five pillars, so to speak. I like to just say, you could use one and that's enough. It's assurance of salvation, but anyways, we'll get into that later. It's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 in case you're wondering. But that's a taste, assurance of salvation. How much of your conflicts, how much of your own inner turmoils, how much of your own angst, how much of your own stress, how much of your own anxieties are all boiled down to the problem of your salvation? Are you assured that you're saved? Or are you over-assured? You see, there's kind of a balance there, isn't there? So we're going to examine that. Number two, self-image. <gasps> there's that self-word. I got no self-image. <laughs> Scriptures teach that we are intricately designed and that each of our basic physical characteristics was prescribed by God and developed according to His plan. Psalm 139, 14, 16. However, today the vast majority of people are extremely self-conscious about physical deficiencies in themselves and an overwhelming majority of individuals would change inborn features if they had the power to do so. By this, they are saying that God's workmanship is inferior to their designed self-image and therefore, he cannot be trusted in other areas of life. Are you telling me that those people that go out and get plastic surgery are like, you know, not trusting God in other areas of their life? Ask them. I mean, we will discuss, as I said, we'll probably take this apart because these are deep and do a tape series on each one. But in the area of self-image, if a person's going out and getting plastic surgery, you know, like say, oh, we got to fix the nose, we got to fix the boobs, we got to fix the chin, we got to do this, tuck, you know, collagen, whatever. J. Vernon McGee once said that if the bar needs painting, paint it. But he didn't say it needed reconstruction. In other words, there comes a place in time where you're changing the glory of the image of God into the corruptible image of man. And Romans describes that process with which you come downward when you were trying to supposedly bring your self-image upward. And the reality of people that go way out of their way to make themselves look better in just the superficial deny the inward issue that really is there. And what is it? The spiritual aspect of maturity. And that is that they doubt God. They have poor love from God. They don't know that God loves them as they are. They have not received God's love as he personified it in Jesus and as he demonstrated it on the cross. So you see, in all of these, there's a big topic in there that you kind of need to think about. And if you really were wise, you know, I mean, I'm trying to get a chalkboard, but I don't have one. <laughs> if I find one in a used store before we start this, I'm going to use a chalkboard like back <laughs> or someone else and try to get into you know really accurately giving some good information on this or we may do a review series you know where we go back in depth into it where we'll just go basic with just video and then when we decide to do an in-depth one if the Lord tarries we'll do it with you know all paperwork and stuff you know and personify it to modern days as well as to the 
presentation that this demands that we do because God wants you to have principles of life that you could live by and apply to your life in every day that you're living in this world. Number three would be purpose in life and the scriptures directs us not to be vague but to be firmly grasped what we know to be the will of God. Ephesians 5, 15 and 17. Today, however, both youth and adults are without clearly defined goals around which they can relate the activities and direction of their lives. They are just whispering in the wind and blown here and there and to and fro with every whim of doctrine that comes along. Someone has well said that if we do not have something worth dying for, we do not have something worth living for either. There you go. What's the bottom line for you? Four, harmony at home. Scripture attaches significant benefit and reward to the one who submits to the authority and direction of the parents as those who are set over him by the Lord, of, by the Lord, Ephesians 6, 1 and 2. And that applies to police, and it applies to FBI, CIA, to political parties, to presidents, to Congress, to those things that people don't want to submit right now. Submission is not a positive topic. So harmony at home would extend to harmony in society. However, in today's society, the father has not assumed his role of spiritual leadership, thus his discipline is without scriptural foundation. The mother has tried to fill the gap, and the children are in a struggle for independence to conform to the fast-changing standards of the society. If there is no father figure, then where does the man draw his fatherly relationships from? How does he act? As one without a father, I know. <laughs> we'll talk about that one. <laughs> Moral purity, five. We don't even say moral purity nowadays. It's all relative. Scripture warns us to flee youthful lusts and to avoid them like the plague, 1 Thessalonians 4.4, 4, 1 Corinthians 6.18. Yet absence of clearly defined scriptural standards is resulting in an acceptance of immoral activities which are producing guilt, frustration, and an inability to fear or think clearly about the future. You know, I keep seeing on the internet this post about forget the past, forget the past, forget the past, forget the past. You don't forget the past. That's, forget the guilt, forget the frustration, forget the recriminizations, forget the whatever. I understand that part. Don't forget the past. The past is part of you. It has caused you to learn from it, to move forward in a positive direction. You don't forget it. And that's where people are making the big mistake, which is why God inspired me to bring out principles of life and to go for it and to teach it. Because we have a society that's doing the feely, touchy, let's just make ourselves feel good to get away with it for a while kind of relationship in Christianity, which is not what God said. you got to know who you are. You're a sinner saved by grace. And I know what I am. I know all my sins. Yes, I'm a sinner. <laughs> Give me five minutes alone. Maybe ten. I'm getting better. Okay, fifteen. Twenty? <laughs> Genuine friendships. One of the most basic humans needs is intimate fellowship with others. When we try to fulfill this need without knowing or following the freedoms and responsibilities on each level of friendship, a host of lifelong conflicts results, and we miss the necessity experience of developing genuine friendships. One person once told me that if you can't have friendship with a man and a woman, you will suffer in your relationship as a husband and a wife. In other words, if all your friends are only men or sexual, and women or sexual, then your only relationship that you're going to relate to in life and in your marriage is sexual. You will not meet on a moral level, you will not meet on an emotional level, you will not meet on a financial level, you will not meet on a interpersonal relationship level, you'll not know how to maintain your distances and your places where you overlap, where you're communal as one, as one person working together cooperatively. So. Do you get the idea, this taste of what principles of life is going to be like? It's a review for me. It's kind of like, yeah. Did I do it? No. <laughs> do I know it? Yeah. Well, you see, God used my life. And I bring this up in passing because I don't like to bring it up too much. I just, I am a scribe. You know, I mean, people don't understand that part. You know, I, I'm a scribe. You know, I... I'm Jewish. No. <laughs> Anyways, besides that, who cares? <laughs> Big deal. I'm more a child of God than anything else. But the point being is, every scroll, Jesus commended 
describes in one way and he condemned them in lots of ways but the one time that he commended them was that every scribe instructed unto the kingdom of righteousness is like a, unto the kingdom of God is like a householder who brings out is like a homeowner it's like a householder who brings out of his treasure things both old and new and that's what I do is that as a scribe, I love to study. I love studying the law. The law is perfect. And I was like, hey, you know, if I could get away with it, I'd be orthodox. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> you know, you don't have to worry about anything or think anything. You know, you just, it's all regulated. But the point is, as a scribe, you know, I see the logic. I see the pattern. I see the conformability of God in his infinite way of being able to use all of this in infinite manifestations of his sovereignty in all ways without it being boxed because I can see the existentialism of it how he can ex extend beyond our boxes because we're created and he's the creator and so as a scribe I am able to take those scriptures and to look at them and to say yes this is what was as the Jew knew, and this is what is as the Christian knows, and this is what God does as his spirit reveals. And so we apply it to our lives because we are going to live eternally in a succession of ages, a ages to 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 ages life. Because it never ends. There's always something going on. That's what eternal life means. It's an ages to ages life. To everlasting to everlasting. That's why we've changed the word and we're losing the meaning, but it's everlasting to everlasting. It's always ages to ages because it's meant to not be dispensational. <laughs> but there is things going on in each one that makes them unique, but not segregated in the sense that they have to exist in a certain way. They just happen to go in that way. It's kind of like when they say church age, you know, you kind of get this idea, you know, it's kind of like, well, we're in the church age. Well, no, it doesn't say that in scripture. <laughs> Nowhere. It's not the church age. It's just God. <laughs> but in order to understand it, sometimes people use words, and then they try to explain it by using the added word to it. And then in their explanation, somebody else listens, and then they think that's what it is, as opposed to that was, you no know, an explanation of what it's doing, not what it regulated is. So that's a little bit of understanding, hopefully, of how I as a scribe, instructed in the kingdom of God, able to bring forth things old, treasures old and new, is able to share the kingdom of God and Jesus in a personal way so that the principles of life would come out to benefit you in a positive way to apply it to today so that you would not be a man cave person. You know, you're not like going out with your jerseys, you know, and putting on paint, you know, and acting stupid, you know, and then turning around and then going to church and putting on a suit and tie and acting smart. Because you know as well as I do, when you go to a football game and you're all rah, 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 ree, 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 you define it as being stupid, don't you? Do you realize the word fits and the shoe applies? There's more to manhood than man cave. There's more to adulthood than being a child. There's more to Christianity than becoming likened unto a child. There's something to be said for becoming like the Son of God. And if you want to be like Jesus, then I recommend to you to follow principles of life. Because then you will become considered a wise man. You may be applied the term sage in your world as you affect people with what you learn on this. Now I admit, maybe it's just some little piece you'll use. More likely, that's probably true. Maybe it will help some single woman raising her child to understand conflict better. Maybe God might talk to you in it. If that's true, then I don't think this was a shameless plug. I think it would be a shame if you missed how God wants to plug you into the principles of life.
and develop them in you so that you can affect all of your life all around you as you were used by him to maybe teach what you've learned.